Good morning, everyone. This morning we welcome the officers and boys and parents of the boys to our morning service, to their enrolment service. And as we meet together in worship, they, along with any other visitors who may be with us, we do hope that they will find fellowship here in Strand this morning as we meet around God's Word. Then the service is next Sunday, the morning service at 11 a.m. and the evening service at 7 o'clock. Both services will be taken by Mr. Boyce. I would remind you that next Sunday, being the first Sunday in November, the evening service will be our monthly communion service. On Tuesday evening, the, the, the meeting that is, that is held in Inverary Fold on the last Tuesday in the month, the time for that meeting has been changed to 8 o'clock at the request of the members of Inverary Fold. So this Tuesday evening, the meeting in Inverary Fold is at 8 o'clock. Wednesday, we have our two usual meetings. The Wednesday hour group continue to meet at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the minor hall. And then on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock this incoming week, the missionary groups will meet in the four homes in our area. Saturday evening is our congregational prayer meeting, as usual at half past seven in the minor hall. And then I would remind you that the second issue of the magazine Evangelicals Now is available on the table at the back of the church. That magazine is free of charge, but if there's anyone who is wishing to order it, would you see Mrs. Elaine McKenzie? Those are all the announcements. Thank you. If I may make one amendment, I, I gave Harry the wrong information before the service. I'll not be taking the evening service next Sunday. I think it's Mr. Black. And then we regret to announce the death earlier this week of Mr. Alan Simpson of Strandburn Park and commit his wife and family circle to your prayerful remembrance. Now let's begin our worship of God this morning as we sing number 229, it's number 87 in the Boys Brigade hymn book, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. So 229, there's of course Psalm 100, All People That On Earth Do Dwell.
Now our first scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, and the verses are 40 to 52, and it's going to be read by a member of our junior section, David Gilmore. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the costume of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk, and as acquaintance, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions, and all they all that heard him were astonished as at this at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought three sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying, but she spake unto them. And he went down with them and came down to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, stature and in favour with God and man. Thank you, David. Let's join together in prayer. <coughs> Come to you, Lord our God, in his name, of whom we have heard in these words. We come uh, knowing that he understands us, for he was one of us, knowing that he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin, knowing that he is not ashamed to call those who believe brothers. So in the name of one uh, who understands us, we come before you and we plead the merits of his name, that your blessing may come through him unto us. We worship you, O Lord, as our God and as our Saviour. We thank you that you have not left us in ignorance of yourself, <clears throat> but you have shown us your power and your glory in your creation. But you have revealed something of your mind and purpose in your word. Grant that that word from which we read on such occasions as this may find an entrance into our hearts today. There may take root and grow 
and produce fruit in our lives. For unless your word changes us, then our knowledge of it is worth nothing at all. We ask, Lord, that throughout this service, you will speak uh, in words that all hearts may comprehend, that the boys who are with us today may know your call to serve you in the world. And we ask that others, O oh Lord, who have come and who seek something from you may not go away disappointed. But as we uh, think together of uh, that word which equips us unto every good work, which reveals Jesus to us, that we may set ourselves to read and study it, and in the reading and studying to find truth and life. O oh Lord, we are not worthy of the blessings that you give us. We must always confess our sins and say how unworthy we are that you should smile upon us. Forgive us our sins, O oh Lord. May our hearts be sensitive to the approach of sin. May we hate it as you hate it and turn from it as you desire. Be among us then today and glorify your name in all that we shall do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, our second scripture reading is from the book of Psalms. It's part of Psalm 119, from verse 97 to verse uh, 104. And Chris McAllister is going to read for us. <clears throat> oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thy commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep thy precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep thy word. I do not turn aside from thy ordinances, for thou hast taught me how sweet are those thy words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thank you, Chris. come in this part of our morning service to the enrollment of our Boys Brigade Company. The Lord Jesus Christ has given to his church the task of going into all the world and making disciples of all men. The Boys Brigade exists to assist us in that work and particularly to advance the kingdom of Christ among boys. The anchor boys and junior and company sections of the 42nd Belfast Company have come to church today for their annual service of enrollment and dedication. I'm going to ask then the officers and leaders to come forward, and as they do so, we'd ask the boys to stand. John Johnson, Captain, George Cole and Sam Kennedy, Lieutenants in the Company Section, Agnes Rowan, Leader in Charge, and Elaine Bush and David Doggart, Lieutenants in the Junior Section, uh, Pat Cooper, Leader in Charge, Linda Ellis and Celia Kennedy, Lieutenants in the Anchor Boys. As officers in the 42nd Belfast Company of the Boys Brigade, you have the privilege and responsibility of presenting the claims of Jesus Christ to boys and young men at the most formative years of their lives. 
realizing the responsibilities involved in your leadership, and recognizing your dependence upon God's strength, do you renew your promise to seek by word and example to advance Christ's kingdom among boys and to promote the habits of obedience, reverence, discipline, self-respect, and all that tends towards a true Christian manliness. May God then give you grace to be faithful to him and successful as you work for him in the boys' brigade. <clears throat> And the leaders may dismiss, and the boys may sit down. One of the uh, leaders was missing this morning. Uh, Philip McDowell has to be away this weekend. Not only is he missing from the uh, lineup of leaders, but also from the next group of people. I'm going to ask the following uh, to come forward. Uh, Sergeant Colin Tate, Lance Corporal Andrew Gracie, and Lance Corporal David Kennedy. You boys are non-commissioned officers in the company, and as such, you are, in a real sense, the backbone of the company. You form the link between the officers and the boys, and much of the success of the company depends on you. Your captain has shown faith in you by promoting you to these ranks. Do you now promise, with God's help, to support your officers loyally carry out your duties in a cheerful and willing way, and at all times to set a good example to the boys of the company. May God help you to keep your promise and to play your part in the service of others and the advancement of Christ's kingdom. The NCOs may dismiss. Now we recognize the whole company. First of all, will the anchor boys stand? Now as the anchor boys keep standing, will the junior section please stand? And finally, along with the others, will the boys of the company section please stand? Jesus Christ said that he came to give us life in all its fullness. The Boys' Brigade exists to bring boys into this new life that Jesus offers. Do you promise to be a loyal member of the Anchor Boys, the Junior Section, or the Company Section, and to support all its activities? Thank you. May God help you to keep your promise and give you strength to overcome temptation and help you to be loyal to your great captain and savior, Jesus Christ. Please sit down. Let's bow for a moment's prayer. Oh Lord, if there is one thing more precious than life itself, it is young life. And we commit to you these boys, asking that in early days you will secure their hearts for Christ, that you will wean them from the world and bring them into the safety of your church. Grant, O oh Lord, that their loving and trusting in Christ, they may serve him throughout their lives. 
To this end, O Lord, bless the work of their officers and leaders. May they know your grace and help, that their vision may remain clear, that they may set their hand again to this work of bringing Christ to boys and boys to Christ. Give them your help, O Lord, and great joy in seeing young lives one for the Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. If I may take just a moment to speak to the boys of the 42nd. No one here would need to be a genius to answer these two questions. What part of the 42nd would you be liable to find the smallest boy in? And what part of the 42nd would you be liable to find the tallest boy in? Well, you don't need to be a genius. The smallest boys are in the anchor boys. And the tallest boys usually are in the company section. And in between, right in the middle, we have the junior section. Just looking down here, we can see in three rows smallest and then getting bigger and getting bigger. wonder do the boys and the anchor boys ever say to themselves, I wish I was just that little bit bigger and a little bit older so that I could be sitting in the next row and have their uniform and be able to do all the things that they do when they meet on, uh, on a Monday evening. And I wonder, do the boys in the junior section think uh, it would be nice to be a little bit bigger and a little bit older and be in the company section and be able to do all the badge work and the uh, PE and go to camp and all the things that are reserved for boys in the company section. I think it's part of the BB's life that you always want to, to progress to start in one section and to move to the next, to wear different uniforms, to play more grown-up games, as we've said, perhaps eventually to go away to camp together, to do badge work, or just get bigger and older. But let me warn you, there's a danger about getting bigger and older. Some boys get so old and so big, you know what happens to them? They become invisible. That's right. They become invisible. At least that's what I think happens to them. Because we see them in nice red jerseys for a few years. And then for a few years we see them in the navy blue jerseys. And then for a few years, we see them with their haversacks and their belts, and then they become invisible. We don't see them at all. I suppose you thought you knew what the BB was all about. And many of you, I'm sure, could recite the object of the Boys' Brigade. And it's good to remember that. But let me tell you in another way what the Boys' Brigade is all about. The Boys' Brigade is there to stop boys becoming invisible. Uh, you know, you say to yourself, wouldn't it be good to be invisible? You could get into all the football matches and the picture house free. Nobody would see you. There was a man once who wrote a book called The Invisible Man. And the invisible man in that book was one of the most miserable and unhappy people that there ever was. He had nobody to talk to. He couldn't tell anybody his secret. He had no friends. And he died very, very unhappy. Of course, boys don't become invisible just like that. But some of them, unfortunately, do 
become invisible as far as the church is concerned. We've seen them, and now we don't see them. They've been here, and now they're not here. What we want you to think of in the Boys' Brigade is this. That it's not just that you'll be in that row or that row or even the, the back row for a few years. But after that, you'll be in all of these rows. You'll not be invisible. You'll be here with God's people, worshiping God. You know, the thing about that is people who are like that well, they have problems like anyone else, but they're people who know great happiness. And they know this too, that when they meet with God's people and believe as God's people believe, that when it comes to that great day and God is calling all his people into heaven, they'll not be invisible there. They'll be there with all the others to serve Christ forever and ever. The Boys' Brigade is to prevent you disappearing. And we trust that through your years in the company, you will come so to love Jesus that you'll want to serve him in and through his church for the rest of your life. Now we're going to sing together. We're going to sing the Boys' Brigade hymn. It's in the Mission Praise Books, and it's number 275. And in that book, we're going to leave out the third verse. It's also in the Boys' Brigade hymnal 152, and in that, you sing all the verses. But at 275 in this book, and in this book, we leave out the third verse.
continue our worship as the offering is received. come to bring our prayers on behalf of others. The world is a world full of needs, filled with needy people. <coughs> and you have told us that we ought to pray for others. We come then, having been reminded already in our service of the great need in the world there is for those who will guide and instruct the young. We pray for such people, that you will raise them up within our churches, that here in organization or Sunday school, they may give of themselves and of that gospel that they have experienced so that the young may be informed about Jesus, the only Savior, about the way of salvation by faith. May those who lead and teach in our church be examples of all that they teach. But we think today also of those who in our wider community have responsibility for the young. We pray especially for our teachers, for those who for a large portion of each week seek to instruct and encourage and to guide young minds. Lord, we hear much today of the great stress and strain under which teachers increasingly labor Grant that they, especially those who love you, may so exemplify the virtues they seek to teach that it may be the easier for children to follow and to learn. Encourage those who serve in our community in this way. May they know that they do a good work, and may they do it well with your help. But we pray most of all today for parents. In a day when authority is scoffed at, 
when authority is overthrown on every hand, then the whole ethos of our society is against authority. We pray for those who have the first responsibility to exercise in love an authority that will be firm and will ultimately be rewarding. Give courage to parents that they may seek in their own homes and among their own families so to act and to teach not according to the ways and thoughts of the world, but according to the principles of your word. May love for children so possess each mother and father that they will not fear even to restrain or to chasten if the children's good is to be the result. And we pray above all else that parents may be delivered from that selfishness which says we cannot be bothered. Children are allowed to run free, to become lost, and to be exposed to all the dangers that this world holds. So in our families and in our schools, in our churches, grant that the young may be nurtured and protected, may be guided and taught. And in all this, we ask you, O Lord, to glorify your own name. We pray again in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Now we're going to sing again from Mission Praise, number 142. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided. 142 in Mission Praise.
Good to see you here this morning, especially if you're a visitor, and especially if you may have come in response to the invitations that have been uh, given out largely through the congregation in these uh, past weeks. I say largely because I noticed this morning, sitting in the minister's room, three little piles of invitations and letters, uh, which I reckon would uh, cover about maybe a twelfth of the congregation. So it may mean that some of our folk haven't actually received the letter of invitation or the little card that is detailing the uh, services that began last Sunday morning and will run right through to the 25th of November under the title, Believe It or Not. These uh, sermons are a direct response to the questionnaire that was taken around the congregation during the summer in which people were asked candidly to give answers to questions about their beliefs, their belief about God, about themselves, about man, about the Bible, about Jesus, about heaven, and about hell, about uh, eternal life. Last Sunday morning, Mr. Black dealt with the first of our series on the subject of God and the dilemma that people often seem to be uh, confronted with, uh, am I to consider God as a loving father or as a judge? I wasn't here last Sunday morning, but the scriptures tell God is a loving father for those who are his children by faith. And God is ultimately a judge and terrible in his judgment to those who are not his children by faith. This morning, the aspect of the questionnaire that we're going to look at is the Bible. Is it true or is it false? I say that in the survey we did in the congregation, people fell largely into two major categories. There were many people, perhaps the majority, who accepted without any reservation that the Bible is the Word of God. The strange thing about that group was that not all the people who believed that were professing Christians. Many people who candidly said, no, I'm not a Christian, but I believe the Bible to be the Word of God. Uh, that seems to me a strange thing. And in a sense, a very dangerous thing to hold the Bible to be true and yet to have your life unaffected by it. On the other hand, there were those who said that though they had a great respect for the Bible and that many things in it were true and acceptable, yet they could not accept it all as truth. We did not press the point, but I wonder how many people, if asked to indicate uh, where their reservations lay, over what areas, I just wonder how many people could have said where they had problems of belief. Now, in looking at this subject this morning, my purpose is not just to convince you of the Bible's truth. Because even if you were so convinced, that in itself is not going to get you to heaven. In fact, we'll see a little later an instance in the Scriptures of people who believe the Scriptures, and yet who are evidently not bound for heaven. That's why I say it's a dangerous thing to say, yes, I am a believer in the Bible, but I'm not a believer in Christ. What we're going to do is simply try to say one or two things, really by way of introduction, uh, about some of the problems that people have or profess to have in relationship to the Bible. That will not be our major thrust. The major thrust will be positive, to set before you what the Bible says about itself. Again, I'm conscious that simply intellectually to convince 
someone of the truth of the Bible is not the same as bringing them to conversion. And I think there are relatively few people who become Christians through a conscious conversion to the truthfulness of Scripture. Uh, perhaps there are some who are suddenly intellectually made aware that this book with which they have been familiar is truth. And from that they go on uh, into faith in Christ. But I think in my experience that's not generally the case. People don't generally come to a faith in Scripture and then to a faith in Christ. The two things usually go hand in hand. Or if anything, uh, the faith in and knowledge of the Bible as truth comes uh, in a way secondarily. And yet we may say a little bit about the arguments that some people use to keep the Bible at bay because that's the impression that's given. People are keeping the Bible at arm's length. They don't want it to intrude in their lives. And in order to effect that standoff from the Scriptures, they have certain arguments. The arguments are arguments. They are debatable points in one sense. And again, I do not profess to be of the intellectual capacity, nor do I think it is ultimately possible to do this, to be able so to surround all your arguments that there is no way out for you but to believe. But let me mention one or two things. There are people who say that they find it difficult to accept the Bible because the biblical view of the origin of the world is unscientific. They say if you read Genesis, those opening chapters in Genesis, you're asking us to take a great leap of faith to believe that that's how the world began. And really, my mind is of such a character that I want more scientific facts and proof about things. And that's why some people say, uh, no, I believe that the world evolved and is evolving. That's how it began, but uh, perhaps they don't even use the word began. Because to use the word begin immediately poses a problem to such people. What began? When did it begin? How did it begin? What were its constituents? And if you're able to say that there were certain things came together, let's push it further back again. Where did those come from? It seems to me that the people who adopt the stance of saying that, no, we cannot believe in a God who made things. We have to believe in the coming together of certain things almost by accident. And that leading through a chain of accidents to the world we know today seems to me to be as much and more unscientific than the theory that they're criticizing. The whole question is the question of origins and beginnings. The Bible simply says this, in the beginning, God. I don't believe people who do not have that belief have a viable, an intelligible, a rational alternative. In the beginning, what? In the same vein, there are people who say that, well, I don't believe in miracles. Jesus walking on the water, turning water into wine, feeding 5,000 from such a small meal, healing people who had been ill all their lives. I don't believe 
in such things. I think what people are basically saying there is that I have never experienced those things. And never having experienced them, I am not prepared to believe them. There are many claims made today for miracles still happening. I must myself confess to a great deal of caution about such claims. It seems to me that many of the miracles that are claimed today are certainly not of the same nature as the miracles we read of in Scripture. But for me, the basic point is this. If I believe in God, and there are many people who say they don't believe in miracles, who say they do believe in God. If I believe in God, is not that saying by definition that I believe that God can do anything? is a strange God, it seems to me, who is circumscribed by your experience, who cannot do the things, only, who can only do the things that you have experienced and understand. That is a God who's really built in your image, who is your size, if you like, who's on a par with you. You can only act as you understand and as you perceive. Or sometimes people take this view. Well, I cannot accept the Bible because it's contradictory right at its heart. The God of whom the Bible speaks is really two different gods. There's the God of the Old Testament and there's the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is a severe God, a God of anger, a God of judgment. The God of the New Testament is a loving God, a God of peace, a God who wants to do good to people. That argument is really an argument based upon a lack of knowledge of what the Bible actually says. Some of the most loving and tender passages concerning God are found in the Old Testament. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. That's Old Testament. The New Testament tells us of a God also of judgment. Tells us of one whom we are to fear because he can destroy both body and soul in hell. A God whose Son, more than anyone else, warns us to flee from the judgment to come. The God of Old and New Testaments is one God, God of love, a God of justice and judgment. Then there are some, perhaps, with a little more knowledge about how the Bible came to us, and may I say that in our midweek meetings, uh, I think it's our next general meeting, we're having a lecturer from the Bible College to uh, speak to us in this very subject, how we got our Bible as it is today. There are some people who have some knowledge of this who say, well, look, Christians believe that the Bible is the Word of God as it was originally given. In other words, when Luke sat down to write his gospel, Christians believe that it was that actual document and the writing on it that was inspired. And so with the writings of the prophets and the letters of the New Testament and all the scriptural books, it's those original documents that really Christians say are truth. And since we don't have those documents, how can we say we have a trustworthy Bible? Let me just quote you something which I read some time ago. 
speaking about the different manuscripts, documents that are in existence today that contain parts or a whole of the Bible. This was a man writing in 1912, and he said, the total number of existing manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament is about 2,500. Now, since he wrote that, since that was written, many more documents have been discovered, the most famous, of course, being the Dead Sea Scrolls. This means that the New Testament especially is quite unrivaled in the abundance of testimony to its original text. The question marks, the variants, are really about some 60 words or one word in a thousand. And even though these may be said to be in some doubt as to what they actually were in the beginning, most of them do not affect the sense of what is written, and not one of them is crucial for any one article of faith or moral precept. In other words, it is simply a fact that God, in giving us the Scriptures inspired as originally written, has gone, can we put it this way, to extreme pains to make sure that that text and those words have been passed down to his church in every generation. But I said to you that we wanted to be more positive than all this this morning, and so we do. What we want to do before we close is simply to set out for you the claims that the Bible makes for itself. First of all, the claims it makes as to its origin, where it comes from. Let me give you one or two examples which will simply highlight what is the consistent teaching of this book from cover to cover. The prophecy of Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Here he is writing a book. And his testimony at the beginning of that book is this, the word of the Lord came. And this is what I'm giving you here in this book that I'm writing. One of the other major prophets, the prophet Ezekiel, again right at the beginning of what he writes. On the fifth month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest. Then we have that tremendous prophecy. But he claims it to be the word of the Lord. Gospel of Luke, chapter 3 and verse 2. In the 15th year, verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, Zechariah in the desert. John the Baptist goes forth to preach, to be the forerunner of Christ. It is claimed for him that his word was the word of God. The New Testament epistles likewise see, say the same thing. They make no apologies for ascribing the origin of Scripture to God. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In parallel with that, of course, Paul's famous words to Timothy, 
all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, or more literally, all Scripture is God-breathed. It has its source and origin in him. The Bible, in its very existence, secondly, bears testimony to the great variety of its writings. In the Old Testament, there is law. There are the prophetic books. Within the prophetic books, there are the major and the minor prophets. There is the wisdom literature, the book of Job, the book of Proverbs. There is the book of praise, the hymn book of the, of the church, if you like, the book of Psalms. In the New Testament, there's biography, there are letters, there's history, there's prophecy. In the whole of the Bible... Some 40 writers over 55 generations producing 66 books. Diverse authors, a king, a shepherd, a prince, a fisherman, a Pharisee, and a Gentile. The immense variety in time and in authorship of this book, and yet the claim, the audacious claim is made that this book is a whole, that it coheres, it holds together. And nowhere does it hold more together than in, thirdly, the subject of the book. The subject of the Bible may be summed up in two words, Jesus Christ. When Peter wrote again in his first letter, 1 Peter 1 and 11, Verse 10, to get the sense, concerning this salvation, the prophets spoke. The prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. The prophetic books of the Old Testament, he says, are looking forward to the coming of Christ. The prophets did not fully understand. It only became clear to subsequent generations. Remember the testimony of Jesus himself as he reproves the Jews, as he admonishes them. He says, you search the scriptures. You give yourself to the, the study of your Bible. Well, he says in John 5 and 39, it is these scriptures that bear witness to me. I am the subject of them. Someone has said the whole Bible is like a, a, a portrait painted by an artist by the hand of God. The figure of Jesus is painted in the Gospels. The whole background of the picture is set out in the Old Testament. The dress, the, the accoutrements, the, uh, the body is described in the Apostles. And most remarkably, when all fit together, the figure comes to life in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Fourthly, what the Bible says about its purpose. We read books for a purpose. We want to relax. We pick a particular type of book. We have our holiday reading. It helps us to unwind. We want to study for an exam. We go to our textbooks that instruct us. We want to uh, look at a subject or uh, find out something, we go to books that inform us. We read books according to their purpose. It cannot be overstated that in order to gain benefit from the Bible, it must be read in the light of its purpose. That purpose is no more clearly set out than in the words Paul wrote to Timothy, commended him for having from his childhood known the scriptures, and then he gives this description, 
which are able to make you wise unto salvation. The purpose of the Scriptures is that people knowing the way of salvation might be saved. It's put a little more obliquely in Paul's words when he writes to the Romans in Romans 15 and verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. That word hope in Paul's vocabulary always means that eternal hope of full salvation in the presence of God. That's what the Bible's for. That's what its purpose is, to shed light upon the way of salvation for us. And it is at this very point that people fail in their appreciation of the Scriptures, for they do not want its purpose. We cannot take the time to speak at any length of the power that the Scripture describes itself as having. Your word is like a hammer, says Jeremiah, that breaks the rock in pieces. The Scripture, says the writer to the Hebrews, is like a sharp sword. It pierces into the heart. It can divide and discern the very innermost being of a man. It even searches out his thoughts and his intentions. And it is that power that makes people wary and uneasy about the Scripture. Nor can we say much about the sufficiency of Scripture. Again, simply to quote what Paul says, all Scripture is God-breathed. Then he tells us the different purposes for it, and he sums it all up in this. He says that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And if perfection, or if you like, fullness and completeness for the Christian is to be found through the Scriptures taught by the Holy Spirit, what more do we need? Remember Jesus told the story of the two men, one rich and one poor, who died. The poor man went, as Jesus put it, to Abraham's bosom. The rich man to the torments of hell. Remember the discussion that in that parable took place between the rich man and Abraham, and particularly his concern for his brothers. He says, I have brothers. Warn them. Send Lazarus that he may tell them. And his contention was this. If someone came back from the dead like Lazarus, they'll believe. Remember Abraham's reply. They have the Scriptures. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And if they will not believe the Scriptures, they will not believe even though one should rise from the dead. There is a sufficiency about the Scriptures. And so we must conclude. In giving this picture of what the Bible claims for itself as to its origin, its variety, its subject matter, its purpose, its power, and its sufficiency. I suspect the problems many people say they have with the Bible is not because they do not understand it, but because they understand it only too well. They understand its implications, for it sets forth in clear detail the starkness of their own plight before God as sinners. It sets out in glorious simplicity the way to be delivered from that, and that is the abandonment of self and the casting of ourselves upon Christ. It sets out the way of faith, the way of obedience, the Christian life in an alien world. As someone has put it, 
It's not that the Bible has been tried and found wanting, but it has been found difficult and left untried. Jesus saying to the Jews, you search the scriptures, it's these scriptures that bear witness to me, yet you will not come to me that you might have life. The figure of Christ stands at the center of scripture, and yet people will not come to him that they might have life. It's one thing to have difficulty over certain things in Scripture. It is another thing to be of the spirit of the closed mind, to be uninterested in truth or the seeking of truth. I dare say that even if you were to say, though I do not believe that truth will be found in the Bible, to be sufficiently open-minded and seeking as to say, I want to know the truth, wherever it lies, will put you in a position of advantage and a position to which God's promise may apply. He who seeks will find. It's not an academic matter. This failure to come to terms with the Word of God and its authority and power for at root, what it boils down to is this. If we have no Scripture that we can trust, we have no Savior whom we can trust. If we have no unerring guide, then we have no unerring Christ. We cannot have one without the other. Believe it or not, the Bible, true or false, the arguments we've given are not powerfully intellectual, are not persuasive in their own right. May the Spirit of God himself give us insight into our need to come and bow before God in his book to allow the truth of God to have its way in our lives. For the chief argument for the Scriptures is this, and it is our testimony, that those who apply it to their lives and follow it find it to be a true book that works, that fulfills what it promises, that brings us light now and will bring us eternal life hereafter. May God bless his word to us. Let's sing as we close. Hymn number 200 in our Presbyterian hymn book. Lamp of our feet, whereby we trace our path when wont to stray. Number 200, sorry, number 200 is, To thee, O God, we render thanks.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.